Disclaimer, this video uses copyrighted material, the use of which has not been specifically authorized by the copyright owner. The use of such material is protected under fair use, which allows the use of copyrighted material without the owner's consent if the material is offered publicly, without profit, and is used for commentary, critical, or educational purposes. No copyrights are claimed by me in this video or any others of mine, and I do not claim to own any videos or images used in this program. Jurassic Fight Club and all material associated with it belong to the History Channel, and all images used belong to their respective owners. If you made an image in this video and would like to be properly credited for it, please contact me, prove you created said image, and I shall credit you accordingly. This video is broadcasted for commentary and educational purposes, and I make no profit from anything used in this video, so it falls under fair use. That said, please be enjoy the video. Hello everyone, this is Paleo Nerd here with the first installment in my scientific analysis series. This is where I analyze documentaries and other forms of media and see whether or not they portray prehistoric life in an accurate fashion. We'll be starting off this series with none other than Jurassic Fight Club. For those of you who don't know, Jurassic Fight Club was an American television series that aired in 2008 on the History Channel. It was narrated by Eric Thompson and hosted by George Blazing, a self-taught paleontologist who also served as the consultant for the series. The show ran for about one season, consisting of 12 individual episodes, which each consisted of recreating a fight to the death between two or more prehistoric creatures. Now, the show has been frequently panned for its emphasis of spectacle over education, but how accurate is this show? Well, it's my job to find out. I'll start the review by going through each episode in order to analyze them. For each episode, I will review both the physiology of the creatures depicted and the fight itself, and afterwards give my input into how to fix the mistakes made in each episode. For the sake of time, if an inaccuracy is consistent throughout the entire series, it will be saved until the end for a series-wide discussion. Also, the episode's biggest killers in Armageddon will be omitted from this analysis, as they present no information that hasn't been covered in other episodes and reuses previous footage. I will also be splitting this analysis into multiple parts, which may become a constant for this series if I have a lot to say, which I typically do. This first part will comprise of the first episode, and the second part will cover the second episode, and so on and so forth, with the final part ending with the series-wide analysis. That being said, let's start with the first episode. The first episode in the series, Cannibal Dinosaur, takes place 70 million years ago in what is now Madagascar, and features a fight between a male and female Majungasaurus, or as the show calls them, Majungatholus, but more on that later. First, what is Majungasaurus? Discovered in 1896 in the Maivarano Formation in northwestern Madagascar, Majungasaurus was a genus of a Belosaurid theropod, a group of carnivorous dinosaurs characterized by their short, broad skulls and their small vestigial arms. This genus consists of only one known species, Majungasaurus crenatissimus which, when translated from Latin, means Mahayanga lizard with many notches, referring both to the Mahayanga province where it was found and the serrations on its teeth. It was the largest predator in its environment. An analysis of the Maivarano formation it was found in has dated it to the Maastrichtian age of the late Cretaceous period, roughly 70 to 65 million years ago, all the way to the KPG mass extinction event. Majungasaurus was also a decently sized theropod, as adults are estimated to reach 6 to 7 meters or 19 to 23 feet in length, 2 meters or 6.5 feet high at the shoulder, and weigh well over a ton. Now, how does this compare to Jurassic Fight Club's portrayal of the animal? 
Well, let's cover the name real quick first. See, in this show, the animal is referred to as Majungatholus, rather than the proper name of Majungasaurus. Where did this name come from? Did the show just make this name up because it was cooler? Well, sort of. See, in 1979, cranial remains were recovered from the Maivarano formation that Majungasaurus was first found in. Since these remains appeared to be dome-like in structure, the remains were classified as coming from a new species of Pachycephalosaur, named Majungatholus atopus, meaning Strange Mahayanga Dome. This was considered a revolutionary discovery, as no Pachycephalosaur was known from the southern hemisphere, being exclusive to North America and Asia. However, these remains were re-described as belonging to an abellasaurid in 1998, and in the early 2000s, it was discovered that the remains belonged to none other than Majungasaurus. As a result, Majungatholus became a junior synonym of Majungasaurus, meaning that while it is technically okay to use the name for the animal, Majungasaurus is the original and therefore proper name for the animal. Since this discovery happened well before the show's debut, it's likely that the producers knew this, but used the junior synonym for the animal because it sounded cooler. Just know for future reference that I will be referring to this animal with the proper name of Majungasaurus from here on out to prevent any sort of confusion. Now how about the actual design for the Majungasaurus? Well, just look. At the bottom is a skeletal reconstruction of what Majungasaurus would have looked like, and at the top is the show's design. There are so many things wrong with this design, but I'll go through them one by one. The most obvious problem is the difference in body shape. As you can see from the skeletal, Majungasaurus is far longer than it is tall, with short, stubby legs and an elongated body and tail, making this animal the dachshund of theropods. And look at the model from the show. The Majungasaurus in the show has the generic theropod body shape of long spindly legs and a short body, very different from the actual animal. This difference becomes more obvious as the show claims Majungasaurus grew to 9 feet tall, almost 3 feet taller than it actually was. Another significant inaccuracy is one that is very common among Abelosaurids. As you can see, the Jurassic Fight Club Majungasaurus has a very well-defined arm, with a visible upper arm and forearm divided by a clear elbow, and four fully developed fingers with claws at the end. However, Abella's sword arms were very, very different, as you can see here, with a visible upper arm, slightly hidden forearm with no discernible elbow, and small underdeveloped fingers these arms seem to serve no real purpose. Although it can still move at the shoulder, the arm is unable to move at the elbow, and the few fingers are fused together to a point where the animal couldn't even wiggle its fingers. As such, these limbs are considered vestigial, as they seem to have no real purpose, and because of the way the arms fit into the shoulder, these puny arms are pointed backwards, with the palm facing inwards likely making it appear as if the animal lacked arms completely. The final two major physical inaccuracies I could find are a bit minor compared to the other two. First, when looking at closer at the two genders, the male has what appear to be osteoderms on his skin. Osteoderms are small bony plates within the skin that make a sort of armor for the animal and is present in modern-day crocodilians. These structures are believed to be common in abelosaurids, as skin impressions of Carnotaurus clearly show these plates. While it is likely that Majungasaurus had osteoderms, there is one problem. These osteoderms are only present in the male, while the female lacks them entirely. If Majungasaurus had osteoderms, they were likely not limited to one gender, and as such, they should be present on the female as well. Also, the skull of Majungasaurus is easily identifiable 
via the single horn-like structure at the top of its head above the eyes. While both the male and female have this structure, the one and the male appear sharper when it was more like a bump in real life. While the bump is pretty small, the addition of keratin likely made this structure larger, and while it resembles a horn, it was likely for display rather than attack, as is the case with the horns of its famous relative Carnotaurus. Speaking of the male and female, I do have to give this series some credit for the distinct male and female models, as aside from one minor detail later in the series that will be discussed later, this is the only time in the series when it, where an animal is shown to be sexually dimorphic. Sexual dimorphism is when the genders within a species have distinct physical differences and is mostly prominent in birds, where males are commonly larger and more colorful. The male Majungasaurus shares many of these traits, as he is larger than the female, has more bright coloration in his skin, and has turkey-like waddles on his face. Meanwhile, the female is relatively bland in design, with simple greens, tans, and browns in her color scheme and lacking any unique features, once again consistent with modern birds. Overall, while the sexual dimorphism is a nice touch, it really can't make up for the incredible inaccuracies in the designs for both the male and female. In fact, I'll even go so far as to say that the design for Majungasaurus is the most inaccurate design in this entire series, even more than the Dromaeosaurus. So overall, not a great start. Now, how about the fight itself? The fight begins at a jungle with a male Majungasaurus searching for a female to mate with. He catches a female scent and enters her territory hoping for a mate while being cautious as she may already have one. So far, pretty accurate, although the male may have also just called females into his territory, but since we can't know anything for sure about dinosaur mating behaviors, this really isn't inaccurate and won't count. Once the male finds the female, he starts a courtship dance, which appears to consist of swaying back and forth. Here's where the problems start. While mating behavior is near impossible to determine with fossils, it's likely that prehistoric dinosaurs, like their modern descendants, had some pretty bizarre mating dances, abelosaurids in particular. Remember those dinky arms from earlier? Well, as it turns out, they may have actually served a purpose that prevented them from disappearing altogether. You see, the shoulder joint in Majungasaurus and other abelosaurids is much different from other theropods, as the head of the humerus is round and ball-like, indicating a substantial amount of motion in the shoulder. This allowed the arms to move sideways, different from any other dinosaur. This has led to a theory developed by two separate groups of scientists who have proposed that the small arms of abelosaurids were used as display structures, and that males would flap their arms to attract females. This has even led to speculation that feathers or skin flaps decorated the arms to make them more colorful and attractive. Basically, using this arm waggling theory, the male Majungasaurus would be standing in an upright motion using his long tail as support and flap his arms multiple times to woo potential mates. With the addition of the large horn bump thingy on its head, this would have been a weird sight in Cretaceous Madagascar. Then again, modern birds are even more bizarre when it comes to courting mates, so this is pretty par for the course. Anyway, the show doesn't use this technique, although this was likely made before that theory was brought up, so I'll give it a slight pass. Back to the fight now. So, the male is trying to court the female, but she remains in an aggressive stance, causing the male to try and bring her to a different area to calm her down. However, for a brief moment, he spots the female's offspring hiding behind her. As it turns out, the female isn't rejecting the male because his mating dance sucks or because he has a terrible personality, but because she already has offspring to look after. 
After realizing this, the male switches from mating mode to kill mode, which appeared to be the only two modes this show thinks dinosaurs had. So he decides he has to kill the baby in order to mate with the mother. So this is pretty accurate as this happens in nature all the time. Now we have the setup for the fight. The male that wants to get the female out of the way without killing her so he can murder her baby and the female who will defend her baby at all costs. The male, being larger and stronger, is able to push the female out of the way and makes a beeline for the baby when this happens. The female rams into the male with her head. This, right here, is incredibly inaccurate. A bell swords could not do this. From what I've gathered, this likely came from that skull fragment I mentioned earlier that was mistaken for a pachycephalosaur. Since it slightly resembles a dome, this show made the ridiculous claim that abelosaurids could butt heads like bighorn sheep. This appears to be common in media, where abelosaurids are seen as the carnivorous equivalents to pachycephalosaurs when they each use their headgear for a different purpose. Pachycephalosaur domes are thick and have many points of evidence that suggest they were used for combat. First, some fossils of these animals have lesions in the dome consistent with blunt force trauma. Second, the bones the domes are made of are a unique form which contain lots of fibroblasts to help wounds heal quicker. On the other hand, Abella's sword skulls were no thicker than any other theropods and lacked lesions or extra fibroblasts. And in the case of Majungasaurus, its head ornamentation was actually very hollow, making it incredibly fragile. This indicates that the headgear of Abella swords were likely for display purposes rather than for combat. So what would happen to the female if she tried this? While she didn't knock the male over, she was still moving at a fast rate and stopped suddenly, which would cause all manner of damage. The sudden decrease in speed would slam her internal organs against her rib cage, possibly rupturing them, and since she hit him head on, she would absorb the full force of the blow directly into her head and down her entire body cracking her skull at the very least and snapping her neck at the very most. Overall, pretty dumb move for someone trying to protect their offspring. Regardless, the two continue their standoff with the male trying to grab the juvenile and the female fending him off by kicking up dirt, something a real Majungasaurus would have a hard time doing, and by whacking him with her tail. While the tail whip only briefly knocks back the male in the show, considering how long and muscular the tail of the real Majungasaurus was, such a blow would have knocked him down and maybe even caused serious injury. Then the two clash in a head-on collision which, if I, as I've established a few seconds ago, would severely wound or kill them. Afterwards, the male uses mock charges to drive the female back away from her offspring and then this happens. The female loses sight of her surroundings. She trips on the log and falls to the ground. This is the opportunity the male's been waiting for. This right here is just so very wrong. I feel like I'm watching a scene straight out of Looney Tunes. The female slightly touches a log and then comes crashing to the ground and goes unconscious. So what exactly is wrong with this? Well, feels strangely reminiscent of back in the day when dinosaurs were thought to be slow lumbering lizards that were super clumsy. But now you know that dinosaurs are very agile and very active animals that were far from clumsy. If anything, the female would have stumbled slightly, not completely fall over, as the real Majungasaurus's incredibly muscular tail would have given it immense balance, preventing it from falling like in the episode. And an animal weighing only about a ton wouldn't have been knocked unconscious from falling over. Especially the female, who likely weighed less than that. Anyway, with the female out of the picture, the male turns his attention to the juvenile, picking him up in his jaws and slamming him into a tree. Again, pretty huge problem here. 
See, using the environment like this is something we take for granted as it actually requires a high amount of intelligence to perform. In fact, the only non-mammals known to use the environment in this faction are highly intelligent birds like crows and parrots. It's far more likely the male would have just crushed the baby with his jaws and his mission's complete. Regardless, the baby's dead now, but the female, now conscious, mounts one final attack on the distracted male. She charges at him at full speed, grabs him by the neck with her jaws, and snaps his neck from the sheer force of the blow, paralyzing him. Oh boy, are there some problems with this. First, while Majungasaurus and other Abelosaurids had pretty impressive bite forces, they weren't as strong as the bone-crushing Tyrannosaurids. In fact, Abelosaurids seemed to be more adapted for biting and gripping rather than slashing or crushing. Their short and broad skulls suggest that they were used similar to that of modern big cats, latching onto big prey like sauropods and not letting go until their prey was dead. Second, even if the male got a broken neck from an attack like this, he wouldn't be paralyzed. He would be dead. While breaking the neck vertebrae would damage the spinal cord, which would normally cause paralysis, there are other essential body parts stored in the neck other than the spinal cord. Mainly, the jugular vein, a large blood vessel that supplies blood to the head and brain, and the windpipe, the tube that transports air from the mouth and nose to the lungs and back. If either or both of these were severed, which would likely happen in an attack like this, death would follow from as short to a few seconds to as long as multiple minutes. Also, minor complaint, but right after the narrator establishes that the male has been paralyzed, you can see his leg twitch, which would be impossible as muscles twitching requires messages from the brain, which can't happen if the spinal cord is severed. Finally, the female checks her baby for signs of life, finds out he's dead, and eats him. This is very likely, as it's extremely unlikely that a dinosaur's maternal bond with her offspring lasted very long after death. And since she just burned a whole bunch of calories for basically no reason, she needs to replenish her energy. George even helpfully explains this for us. The brain of a dinosaur works like a light switch. There's an on and there's an off. They only think of one thing at a time. They live in the very moment they're in. When she realized that her baby was dead, the female Majungatholus' brain switched over from maternal to dinner. She now sees her baby as a food source. She's got to replenish the calories she burned fighting the male. But of course, this isn't enough for the female, who turns to the now defenseless male, and she starts to eat him. Overall, this fight could have been handled better. Now, before I get to the how to make it better part, there's two more issues I need to address. First, the title, Cannibal Dinosaur, is very inaccurate. This entire episode seems based off the premise that Majungasaurus was the Hannibal Lecter of dinosaurs, actively hunting and killing members of its own kind. This is a recurring theme in Majungasaurus' betrayal in media, as it's commonly referred to as the Cannibal Dinosaur. This seems to go off of two major points. One, fossil evidence, and two, lack of food sources. First, the fossil evidence. The entire Majungasaurus was a cannibal paleo meme started with the discovery of several bones coming from Majungasaurus with teeth marks that only match one animal, Majungasaurus. This was considered the first concrete proof of dinosaur cannibalism. But what does this discovery really mean? Well, sorry to disappoint, but Majungasaurus likely didn't actively hunt its own kind. Instead, it's likely that the teeth marks were either the casualty of a dispute over territory or mates, or the result of a Majungasaurus scavenging the carcass of another Majungasaurus. Many of the marks on the bones don't appear to have been fatal injuries, 
and others may have been inflicted after the animal died, making the Majungasaurus was a cannibal theory about as dead as a dodo. Also, fighting within a species is not new to large theropods, as many fossils have had similar wounds that came from their own species. Ranging from Carcharodontosaurs to Tyrannosaurs, it seems that many large theropods commonly fought with their own kind, with very few scuffles having been fatal, as evidence of healing has been observed on some of these fossils. Now, how about that second point, the lack of resources? Some people, this documentary included, have argued that there wasn't enough food to sustain a population of large predators, so they had no other option but to eat each other. This is complete bullshit. Majungasaurus had more than enough to eat. While its main food source was likely the giant Titanosaur Rapetosaurus, Majungasaurus would have eaten anything it could catch, including the small Noasaurid theropod Mashikasaurus, the pug-like crocodilian Simosuchus, mammals like Vintana, and even a giant frog called Beelzebufo. And there was more than enough space for resources to support a population of Majungasaurus. Madagascar is a very large island with an area of over 200,000 square miles. And it wasn't that different during the late Cretaceous. In fact, geologically speaking, Madagascar only became an island very recently as it split from the subcontinent of India during the late Cretaceous period 88 million years ago. And by the Maastrichtian era, Madagascar was about the same as it is today, geologically speaking, meaning that there was more than enough room for a population of large theropods to inhabit the area without running short on resources. However, while Majungasaurus wasn't an active cannibal, it was opportunistic, so it's very likely it would have hunted juvenile specimens of its own kind if it meant getting a meal, kind of like the male in the episode and it wouldn't have hesitated to eat a Majungasaurus carcass if it came across one. Now that I've explained that, I'm down to the final issue, which kind of tears the entire premise of the episode apart. From what I've researched, fights between two different genders from the same species are quite rare in nature, and near non-existent in sexually dimorphic species. With sexually dimorphic species, the reason why is really quite clear. Regardless of whether the male or female is the bigger and stronger one, these kind of differences tend to discourage conflicts between genders as the smaller gender is put at a natural disadvantage. Now, males killing offspring to mate with their mothers is nothing new in the animal kingdom especially among African lions, where it is common to see a male take over a pride and kill off all the cubs in the pride to ensure only his offspring survive. While the fe females may try and stop the male, they rarely succeed and their cubs end up dead anyway, while their mothers refrain from putting up too much of a fight. The male Majungasaurus would be no different. In fact, it's very likely the female wouldn't resist the male at all, and for one big reason, survival instinct. While the female may have some bond with her offspring, it's not as strong as that of mammals and even some birds, and it is not something a female would risk her life for. In fact, the female would likely not want to risk injury at all and she would probably just let the male kill her baby, as it's a better option than killing herself fighting a battle she might not win. Again, this does ruin the entire episode, but this is where the final section comes in. How to make it better. First, use an accurate design for the animal. This should be obvious. Second, ditch the battle of the sexes premise and simply make it a fight between two adult males. Third, make the fight over something large predators would actually fight over, like a kill or a mate. Fourth and final, don't make the conflict fatal for the loser. Death rarely occurs as a result of fights, and most territorial disputes rarely spill blood. 
Sure, it may sound boring, but it provides a golden opportunity to be a real documentary by showing audiences the reality of fights in nature and how non-violent conflicts typically are. Overall, the first episode isn't doing any favors for this series. Although this is one of the most inaccurate episodes in this series, so the rest won't be this bad. Well, that's it for part one. Part two should be coming relatively soon and will consist of my analysis of the second episode, T-Rex Hunter. That's all for today. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.